Thank you, Heather, for the nice introduction. You know, I actually thought that uh, the keynote was going to be at 7.52 or something like that. So I was still like kind of just hanging out in the back, um, kind of turn together my thoughts and really think about what I was going to say. So, but now, you know, uh, Rosalinda, uh, I mean, Rosalinda Guillen, if you know her, she's kind of a, a sink or swim kind of person. So she just throws you in front of people and you have to talk or do something, dancing, do what you can, um, and always be prepared for that. So that's kind of, I think, for the last, um, since, uh, let's see, 2012, I started in C2C, that's been kind of um, the way that I've been learning. I'm usually a shy person. I don't really like to talk that much. Um, but, you know, you always have to be prepared for that moment when Rosalinda throws you in front of people and, and to talk. <laughs> Um, so it's good to be here at SLE, uh, the Strengthening Local Economies Everywhere Dinner. Um, I was actually surprised that I was uh, uh, chosen. Um, I think uh, one of my uh, um, initial thoughts was like, are you sure you didn't want Ramon Torres to speak? <laughs> if you know Ramon, he's the Familia Sonidas uh, president. And uh, I usually have to do the interpretation for him. So, and that's actually one of my favorite things to do, just to hang out and talk to Ramon. It kind of feels like I'm, I'm there, but it's like mostly just translating for Ramon. Um, so I get some of his shine. So, but thank you, I'm humbled uh, that you thought of me to be here for the assembly, uh, um, for the gathering today. Uh, I also shout out to uh, the folks from God Green and that took us on the Just Transition Express to the Bay to protest the GCAS. So I want to send a shout out to God Green. We did a, was it a, a 30 hour ride uh, to be part of the It Takes Roots delegation down to the Bay to protest, uh, you know, uh, to ask for real climate justice, not one that's going to be dictated by corporations. Um, you know, and for us, uh, being in the farm worker uh, rural area, it was important for us to connect with our people here in the city, uh, try to build that solidarity between the urban and the rural. So, Got Green has been a sister organization. We've been sister organizations for, for a long time, I think, uh, working on many projects, you know. Um, they were also one of the main uh, supporters of the boycott and supporters of farm workers. Uh, when they went out on strike in 2013, um, along with CAGJ, um, they were some of the main drivers of why the boycott got to be as big as it did. Um, because uh, Got Green and CAGJ helped us promote it in the big cities. Um, so we're always thankful and grateful for that. Um, all the farm workers, uh, I really appreciate that because you invited us into your communities uh, to give talks and show solidarity like that. So for that, we're also forever grateful. Um, let me see, I don't wanna, I wanna also send a shout out to, I don't know if people from Hugs are also here, Hugs? Yeah, Hugs has been also, I think, these are the community organizations we look up to, um, being in an isolated corner in, in, um, in Northwest Washington. You know, we hear about Hilltop, the work Hilltop Urban Gardens is doing, uh, what got green, CAGJ, these are the things that gives us hope, especially being uh, such in a, rural kind of place that we kind of, it's hard to get, um, get connected to our, our overall food justice, food sovereignty community. So when we hear about people in Tacoma organizing, people of color organizing, taking on like these massive projects and, and uh, organizing communities, uh, we're always uh, thankful that we're, we're also uh, working in collaboration with you and hopefully events like this and you know, the assembly that's coming up are places that we can strengthen those connections. Um, also, UFCW, I think, is also in here. Yeah. So UFCW, also big supporters. You know, we want to make sure we um, just send a shout out to UFCW for their solidarity. Um, and again, big supporters of the farm workers. They were showing up in 2013 at the Sakuma labor camp, um, you know, asking what we needed and everything. So. I know we remember all that thing, all those things, so hopefully someday we can return it back to you. Um, let me see. So I kind of put together a PowerPoint uh, like uh, two hours before we got here. So I'll try to, uh, uh, the way that we kind of make sense of the world, uh, you know, and a uh, big shout out to the 
uh, people from the Climate Justice Alliance and Grassroots Global Justice that, uh, and Movement Generation that put together the, the whole concept or the idea around uh, just transition. So that's kind of how we try to make sense of, our, of the work, um, the, the ways that we come up with solutions. Um, when we talk about uh, especially the legacy that we inherit, uh, luchando por una vida agroecológica, uh, fighting for a life that's agroecological. What does that mean? It's kind of a, a big, a, a mouthful. Um, you know, uh, all of this, the reason that I'm here is because of all the work that Rosalinda has done, uh, the United Farm Workers have done, uh, the Landless Peoples Movement from Brazil have done, and all the work that C2C and the the folks that are still working, you know, you asked uh, how we can do all these things. It's because we have an awesome team at C2C that puts it all together. Um, so I want to recognize like the law, the, all the work that, you know, Brenda, Maureen, Modesto, all the folks that uh, really um, are the drivers be, uh, be in C2C. And of course, Rosalinda Guillén. So I wanted to uh, recognize all that work, that it's a team effort. It's not just uh, me over here talking, but it's a team effort. Um, so, uh, yes. It's the, it's the collective. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about agroecology, um, you know, we have to really focus on what are the current situations farm workers are going through right now. You know, uh, we call it, uh, what are the bad things? And it's things that have been going on for generations. Uh, fights that my grandparents were, uh, uh, you know, that they had to face, uh, my, the parents of Rosalinda, every farm worker, these are the generational issues that have been present no matter what, it, what era or what, um, where you work at in the fields. It could happen here in the United States, it could happen in Africa, in Indonesia, all these things are, are happening within the food systems and consider, and in the context of farm workers, you know. Uh, being on the bottom rung of the industrial agricultural model, um, you know, we're exposed to pesticides, uh, wage theft, competition. Uh, that's the way that uh, growers make us work uh, by using this piece rate, piece rate system where you're not paid at an hourly rate, you get paid by uh, how much you pick, uh, pretty much working your bodies until exhaustion and even beyond that, um, competing with your fellow worker, uh, all for the name of profits. Um, we get the racism, institutional, cultural, uh, historical racism that's ingrained into the agricultural uh, system as it is right now. Uh, since the founding of this country, the agricultural system has been based on racism. Um, you know, we still talk about the sexual assaults that are rampant, um, especially in this moment of what's happening with the Supreme Court um, and the, the, yeah, hiss. <laughs> you know, it's almost, uh, I was watching the confirmation or the, the thing the other day and it's almost, it's kind of like a, a show, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain kind of how people discredit somebody that's over there uh, sharing their story about how they were attacked and then how they get um, shut down pretty much. Um, and it's, it's hurtful to see and it's happening on a grand scale like that, especially in front of everybody. So. I kind of, uh, you know, this is, it's, it, this is a reflection of the, the, the things that we need to change. We need to really, this is why we need to transition away from capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy, because things are, these are going to continue happening. <laughs> we get the displacement. Um, a lot of the people that migrate here have been displaced from their original communities. Uh, when you talk to workers, nobody really wants to leave their home, you know? And eventually, workers that are here, their main uh, drive is to someday go back home. Um, but it makes it impossible when, say, your community is being uh, overrun by a mining corporation, as in a lot of places in Mexico, a lot of Canadian corporations are starting to buy up land. Uh, Monsanto and all these uh, GMO companies are starting to buy up ha um, 
are starting to buy up lands and displacing farmers. I mean, it's no secret about what NAFTA has been doing uh, since its inception in 1994. Um, so, you know, and even if people migrate here and work and want to go back, what kind of community are they going to go back to? You know, is that the community that they're going to go back to is going to be uh, not the same as when they left it? We got also the ongoing uh, fight against the immigration, uh, ICE and the police, the racial profiling. Um, you know, a lot of these measures are put in place as a way to uh, stifle and stop farm worker organizing, especially in rural communities. The way that immigration is always around, the police is always around. They're threatening with a constant threat that if you speak up or protest or go on a picket, that you will be deported. So it's a constant um, struggle, knowing that you can be facing all these things, but knowing that you want to do something, but you can't because the police or the immigration is there ready to detain you and deport you. Um, the H2A and the H2C, um, that's another bad thing that's being faced. It's, it's sort of a new and uh, old thing. If you go back to World War II, when the Bracero program was first uh, started here in the United States when millions of GIs went to go fight in World War II. Um, there was a need for people to do the agricultural work. So the United States and Mexico came up with an agreement where they were going to ship in millions of Mexicans to do the farm labor. Um, that, that program was called the Bracero program. Um, after the World War, World War II ended, um, uh, and everybody came back, there was no more need for these workers. So people started getting deported by the million, sometimes without getting paid. Um, one of the kind of stories or kind of the narratives that gets thrown out there is about how the US won the, the effort in World War II, the fight, um, um, the fight, the war in World War II. Um, but I don't think enough emphasis is put in uh, for the braceros that fed the country and the GIs uh, for them to actually win the war. So I think the braceros, <laughs> Mexican laborers actually kept the country going while the war was happening, kept everybody fed. And at the end of the day, um, you get thrown out of the country. And it's an ongoing repetitive system. Um, nowadays, it's the H2A program. How, uh, how we're seeing that, uh, that come up, um, you know. Um, and then the expansion of the H2C. Um, if people aren't familiar with the H2A program, um, is there, I think there's like the next slide. So this is some of the bad. Here's a little bit basically what an H2A program does and why we're fighting so hard against it. Um, so it's the neoliberal uh, solution to a labor shortage. Um, and the crisis, the labor shortage crisis, and immigration. Um, so, you know, capitalism and neoliberalism is really good at creating these things we call false solutions. The H2, it's, uh, it creates problems. You know, if you read Naomi Klein, there's the thing called the shock doctrine where capitalism creates a problem, and then capitalism also comes up with uh, the solution that only benefits corporations. So in this case, uh, say in our context in Washington, um, there's a, a fake labor crisis that is being thrown around, um, uh, saying that there's not enough farm workers ready to do the work. Um, there's no investigation, there's no, no, no nothing to actually prove that there is a labor shortage. Um, growers just are usually given the benefit of the doubt. Um, and growers then can apply to a federal program called the H-2A. Um, to request however many workers they have. In Whatcom County, we have two farms that are using H-2A um, uh, workers. We have uh, Sarvanam that had 600, and Crystal View that uh, is over 90. Um, so they were claiming that there was labor shortage. Um, so they got rubber stamped, and they brought in workers from Mexico um, and had them working, and basically in all these conditions. So. To be a H-2A worker, where they go and recruit you in your country, uh, uh, you usually get told you only can work for one grower. You can only be contracted for a period of time, from three to nine months to a year. Um, 
you can be fired for and deported for any reason. Um, if you get hurt, you get sick, uh, if you uh, speak out, uh, for whatever reason, you can get fired. Um, but you're promised fair wages, food, transport, um, housing for free, all of that will be free. Uh, but you can lose all that the moment that the company doesn't need you or doesn't want you anymore. The moment that you ask for, for something. If something is wrong uh, and you speak out, uh, you can get deported. Um, and I wanted to kind of, kind of, uh, who's seen here, sorry to bother you, right? Um, you know, they have that program, I think it's the next slide. They have that program, Worry Free, where they give you three hot meals and a place to sleep uh, as long as you do all the work and you don't get paid. So it basically the H2A is a version of Worry Free. If you see Sorry to Bother You, um, there's a program that's in there that's basically that, where corporations uh, get all the labor for free and they promise everybody a place to to sleep and a place to eat. And a lot of the, one of the characters actually is like considering going into worry free. Um, you know, and what does that have to do anything with agroecology? I think it's important to point out that this is the trend that's starting to happen all over labor and farm work. Um, how workers, say the UFCW workers um, that are organizing for better contracts in, um, in, um, Draper Valley, so let's say Draper Valley, uh, the chicken processing, one in my hometown in Mount Vernon, Washington. Um, say those workers uh, want to organize and ask for better wages, you know, or for union representation, um, and the company doesn't want that. Uh, they can now, with the expansion of the H-2A program, the probable expansion of the H-2A program and something called the H-2C program, where processing workers can start getting the same treatment. They can get all fired and brought in uh, a whole new workforce from Mexico, not only in processing, but in construction and service jobs. So we're starting to see the corporations fight for the H2C and the expansion because they know the, these guest worker programs are so uh, beneficial for them, while at the same time quashing any, um, any uh, worker resistance. Um, and that's a dangerous thing to go to. Once all the lots of the things that we have here, um, you know, the, our uh, healthcare programs, uh, you know, a lot of like quality programs at work, uh, overtime, uh, min minimum wage, child labor uh, regulations, all that became possible because of the worker movement. And if there's a worker movement that's being suppressed, it's going to make it really hard. Uh, for for us to organize and win back those um, win back those rights. Um, just to mention, uh, I think it's important to note that agri and if you work in agriculture, you don't have the right to collectively or, uh, bargain with your boss. Um, yeah, it's something that we need to change. Uh, we need to. There's also no. I think the, the youngest you can work at a farm is 12 years old in Washington State. You can still, so when we talk about child labor, it's been abolished in many places in the United States except for farm and farm work. Uh, no minimum hours worked. Uh, you can work 24 hours uh, and it's perfectly legal as long as they give you lunches. Um, no overtime. Um, so these are all the, the things that we're seeing coming out of the agricultural, industrial agricultural model. And these are the things that we need to stop and have it, we have to know what we're up against to know how we can change it. Can we get the next slide? So Arundhati Roy, uh, one of our, we call her one of the founders at C2C. Um, she had this, this great uh, quote. I'm not gonna read it all, but it's basically saying that we have to stop participating in systems that are oppressing us. Um, we actually have the power to change a lot of things. Um, as a collective, you know, the corporate, cor the corporate revolution will collapse if we refuse to buy what they're selling, their ideas, their version of history. All of that will collapse if we all stop participating into that. So us as people and workers, we have a lot of power. Um, so I think it's important to note that when we talk about what is agroecology and why it is a solution for us, yes, it's about um, eating healthy, it's about 
um, you know, using methods that don't hurt the earth or uh, animals or other people. Agroecology is that, but it's also a political consciousness, a thing that we call formacion, uh, raising your political conscious. Um, can we switch it to the side? So, you know, and we talk about what is agroecology, if you haven't heard agroecology ever before. These are possible answers according to La Via Campesina, who coined, uh, who has, it's two, the world's largest social movement. Uh, over 200 million peasant, farmers, fisher folk, indigenous people participating all over the globe. Um, so it's important to recognize that agroecology comes from a lineage. And when we talk about the legacy, uh, agroecology just didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a vacuum, out of a practice, out of a thought. Um, a thought that was developed over centuries and centuries of people working the land that knew how to take care of the land. Um, you know, uh, it's been invisibilized by corporate agriculture um, to benefit white supremacy, or we call it white Eurocentrism here. So that's why when we talk about agra um, and all these, uh, these things that uh, uh, Bill Gates is doing, uh, which I don't even know Bill Gates was a farmer, but eventually he's farming, trying to farm in Africa. Um, you know, he's, <laughs> he's selling a vision, a version of his way to change agriculture in Africa, saying that we're going to go over there, we're going to teach Africans how to grow food, as if Africans haven't been growing food since the beginning of history. You know, that's the kind of thinking that we need to start undoing, that corporate solutions are not in the benefit of communities or the communities that are, that are in resistance. Um, you know, and this is also, uh, agroecology is not something that can be commodified. It's something that's passed down as we call it campesino to campesino or peasant to peasant. Um, there's many scholars that study agroecology um, that have written about it extensively and, and beautifully, but the, the key uh, of agroecology is that it's been passed down farm worker to farm worker, peasant to peasant uh, for generations. Uh, that knowledge exists within, between us. So when you talk to a farm worker and, you know, uh, you know, many people uh, maybe would think that just farm workers know how to pick berries and that's it. But beyond that, farm workers probably know about the farm that they're working on more than the owner because the workers are the ones that are there daily watching out to the plants from the seed all the way to when it gets harvested. So agroecology encapsulates all that, all that, that knowledge. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, the political, you know, this is the, the history that we need to start uh, reclaiming that it's in us that that history and that legacy of resistance it's already in us we just need to recognize it when we see it that's why uh, when we see hilltop urban gardens uh, uh, growing food in a black community uh, that's agroecology when you're fighting back against sodas soda companies uh, that's a form of agroecology when you're learning back yeah when you're learning around uh, uh, you know uh, uh, how to cook your traditional plates, uh, your traditional foods, your moles, your, your salmon, all that is part of agroecology. It's a kind of a thing that, it's a, another fancy term uh, that if you want to learn, we have like this whole curriculum at C2C. Uh, there's a term called organicity that makes all these things possible where we have the way that we organize ourselves and other sectors uh, to be all flowing in one, in one direction. Uh, can we get the next slide? Um, so basically, it's a people science. Industrial agriculture and corporations don't want to recognize agroecology because they haven't found out a way to commodify it. Um, and it's something that shouldn't be commodified. Um, you know, if there's, you know, there's like things like permaculture and things like that, which are, are good because they show you how to work with the, with the land um, and what you have at your disposal. But at its very core, one of the very cores of permaculture is that it, it comes from this uh, uh, way that you have to pay into it to learn what, learn what permaculture is. Agroecology does not, that is not about what agroecology is about. It's not about commodifying these ideas. So yeah, and it comes from, uh, it creates this common language, a common practice that we all can communicate with, whether it be from Africa, from Mexico, from all these other places, a campesino from Africa can communicate with a campesino from Mexico, an indigenous person, and they can all relate because they're all going to be sharing the same wisdom 
uh, about you know how corn grows in one region and what do you do to to grow your seed in the winter you know this is what we do we start exchanging ideas um, and through that you start creating those personal connections that are more the most important especially if you're trying to build a movement that is resisting against um, all these uh, false solutions that are getting thrown at us by by the corporations Can you get the next one so how do we build the good how we've been doing it here in Washington despite all the bad um, the historical bad that has been happening um, even since um, you know, uh, my family moved up. Uh, I was originally, uh, my family's from Mexico. I was born in Texas. And we migrated back and forth uh, since the 1980s. Um, and we never saw any, I mean, we heard about Cesar Chavez and the UFW, uh, but none of us uh, knew how to even like, get into that. Um, it wasn't until more recently when Familia Sonida started organizing that gave us the example you know, you read about it in books, but now when you see it and you participate, it's a whole different thing. How do you build the good? It's like I don't the Roy, as you stop and starve uh, the things that are hurting you. So you boycott from Driscoll's uh, the corp, the world's. You boycott Driscoll's, which is one of the world's largest berry distributors. Um, uh, uh, a corporation that has been hurting people all over the world continues to this to this day. Um, you unionize, you know, workers organize. Not, so again, nothing, everything, everything that's created uh, comes from work and from labor. Um, so for, our, for us at C2C, um, that's where our, our passion lies of organizing workers. That's where, that's where the point where capitalism and labor get to, get to have it out. Um, and we're trying to change the system. Workers have a lot of things to say other than just being, um, you know, just uh, pieces that can be replaced once you get hurt. So workers actually have a lot of, a lot of power over that. Um, building the good also requires uh, creating governance processes. If the current structures aren't helping us, if the legal system is made to oppress us, why are we still why are we still putting our confidence in a system that's built to, at the end of the day, uh, take our livelihoods away? So we have to establish uh, processes that our community comes up with, and agroecology opens up that opens up that, that that place where we can dialogue around that. That there is not one form of government or one form of uh, of, of governance better than the other. Um, it's the one that makes sense to, to your community. And that's what food sovereignty, I think, tries to talk about, where you cre create a food system with what you have around. And that's, a, that's what we believe about these governance processes, that, um, um, that communities get to decide what to do uh, with their labor, with their land, with their water. Um, and that's why we've been inviting people to the food sovereignty assembly um, to get, get a, a little taste of what a uh, participatory democratic process looks like, one that's ongoing, um, one that goes beyond voting. I know there's a lot of, of important voting things that are going to be happening. Um, so participate in that, but at the same time, start building your own governance process within your own communities. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, Familias Unidas has shown us that Contracts and boycotts and um, elections can come and go, but if you don't have anything to call your own, you actually don't have nothing. You can be displaced, you can be fired, um, you, you'll be forced to move around. Um, so that's why uh, we have to go back to the old school ways of how unions used to organize and try to seize the means of production. So we can't depend on landlords to look after us. Um, if anything, they're trying to get rid of us. Uh, they're raising our rents like every month, uh, year by year. Um, so we need to start really thinking about how do we actually start seizing the means. We have the, the knowledge, the capacity to take care of land, take care of each other. Uh, trying to establish a governance process where we can actually start thinking about what it means, what does it mean to have uh, land for ourselves. Uh, what does it mean to have homes for ourselves? 
um, um, a, a short story. Uh, we had to be in Bellingham. I live in. Uh, I used to live in a, a lettered streets. It's kind of like close to downtown and it's really a really nice neighborhood. It's walkable and everything. Uh, but this year we had to move because our rent went up by 52%. Um, yeah, uh, so this is, uh, you know, we had to f almost be homeless for a couple of days while we found a place. Luckily we were able to find a place. Um, and we're trying to, this is over that period, I think we moved in in 2013 to this June, July, we had paid over $100,000 of rent collectively. Uh, we live in a collective house, so it was over $100,000. And we were like, we could have bought a house with that much money. Um, so, you know, this is why we need to start thinking about how do we seize the means? Can we get the next one? So, Che Guevara is a big hero. Uh, and this comes, <laughs> this comes from the, uh, the, the context of uh, Latin America, but it also resonates a lot. You know, we start thinking about seizing the means and new governance. This actually means that we have to create a whole new economic system, which means that we need to start creating better forms of ourselves and fighting for uh, how, how do we start changing ourselves to become all these things. Um, you know, stop, uh, stop thinking about the cap, get rid of the, uh, what, Somebody from the MST told us to get rid of the, the, the vices of capitalism that are ingrained in our heads. Uh, the meritocracy, the individualism, the, you know, all the competition. Get rid of those vices within your head. Um, you know, and we make revolutions with our habits, our minds, and our deeds. Uh, that's important because we have to start thinking uh, in more radical ways, uh, especially in this moment when capitalism is... It's quickly evolving um, and taking a lot of the, the, our knowledge, or a lot of our terms, and using it for their benefit. That's like how that Nike is now sponsoring you know, like the whole Kaepernick thing and the police brutality. You know, you see capitalism starting to, to work its, its wheels to start shifting the narrative about what real resistance is. It's not consumer activism. That's not the real, the real revolution. Can we get the next slide? You know, in, when then we talk about, you know, Fidel Castro who overthrew the imperialist in, in uh, Cuba. You know, we have to actually think of the impossible. Like we have to actually dream of what is impossible. You know, a lot of people maybe thought it was impossible for indigenous Mexican workers that don't know how to speak Spanish or English to, over, to beat a corporation. But, you know, because they were able to imagine themselves winning and getting a contract, they were able to do it. Um, you know, they were told that they were crazy, you know, that they were never going to win with no money, no resources, no nothing. Uh, uh, all they had was their labor and their, their ganas or uh, your will. I don't know how you say ganas in, in English. Um, and then... You determine to fight in every circumstance, so you take the fight everywhere. You take it to the streets, to legislature, you take it to, to the slea dinner, you take the fight everywhere. Can I get the next slide? And I think that was the end. Um, but, <laughs> but one more, one more thing. Uh, so last year at Sarvanan, there was a strike of almost 100 workers, H-2A workers, that were working under the H-2A system and the corporate agriculture, uh, squeezing all their energy out. Uh, and sadly, one of our farm workers passed away. So that's why we are now more determined as ever to end the H-2A program and stop the expansion of it, uh, the H-2C program. Um, we want to fully support Familias Unidas, who's given us tremendous examples of what is possible when you start dreaming big and what is, you know, what you can do as a, a, a organized collective body uh, with uh, participatory uh, democratic practices within it, one that's culturally uh, uh, appropriate, one that we know for generations. 
Um, they were able to beat a corporation, negotiate a contract, one of the best contracts for farm workers anywhere, and now have uh, are in uh, next year they're already going to renew their, their contract again to make it even better. Um, but not only that, they know that contracts again the company can do whatever they can move they can do a lot of things they can bring in machines uh, so what they've been thinking a lot of the members have been thinking is that how do we seize the uh, means of production um, how do we make it that workers don't have to die anymore don't have to work in pesticide filled uh, filled uh, um, fields so they've been think talking about and have done something that we thought it was impossible they built their own uh, worker owned cooperative and this is one of the banners and within a couple of hopefully uh, within a, in the near future they'll be able to have over 60 acres where they're producing blueberries raspberries strawberries all the things uh, that they were fighting for and boycotting all the bad things now they're gonna be the ones that get to produce food without injustice on their own terms so we don't have farm workers passing away anymore, where farm workers actually are given the power to, to dream and to imagine, and we as a community work in solidarity with them. Almost anything is possible, including building a new food system, a new economy, and I think that's something that we want to share with you all, that um, coming from a rural place, almost 90% white, that a group of farm workers was able to be back a system. Even if it's just a moment in time, we were able to set that example and hopefully it'll send a ripple effect throughout the, the whole country and the whole world. So, uh, with that, I want to leave you and thank you all for, uh, for letting me talk for a couple of minutes and showing you the, the, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so I want to say, uh, um, it's been an honor to be here invited. Um, we'll be around if you want to talk to us uh, about some of the plans. And again, come to the U.S. Food Sovereignty Assembly so you can meet the farm workers, meet the people that are coming from around the world. CAGJ has been instrumental in getting, making that happen. So again, uh, thank you for having us and si se puede. <laughs>